Hi all. So ATP, the molecule adenosine triphosphate, is the energy currency of the cell. And what that means is that this molecule, this structure that you see here, is a molecule that works as a small battery or power source for all endergonic reactions in the cell. So if something will not happen unless it is fueled by energy from the cell, most of the time that energy is coming in the form of ATP. ATP has the structure that includes a ribose sugar, adenine, and nitrogenous base. These two parts are ones you would find in an RNA nucleotide. And there is not just one, but three phosphate groups. So when the molecule looks exactly like this, it is called adenosine triphosphate, the three phosphates. It is possible to have one of these phosphates missing, then it will be called ADP, adenosine diphosphate. And if there's just a single phosphate, meaning it's just a normal RNA nucleotide with a single phosphate like they all are, those would be called adenosine monophosphate. And all three of those exist in the cell, but we will spend specific attention on ATP, adenosine triphosphate. So please remember with the full name of this molecule, adenosine triphosphate, and that it is composed of a ribose sugar, which is a five carbon sugar, a five carbon monosaccharide, adenine, which is a nitrogenous base. There are five nitrogenous bases, and this is one of them. It's always that one for ATP and a chain of three phosphate groups. This rotating, space-filling model of an ATP molecule shows its three components. On one end, the three phosphate groups with their purple phosphorus atoms and red oxygen atoms. And this is what it looks like in a 3D uh, perspective instead of just looking at a flat diagram of it but we are not going to go deeper into that. It's just that this molecule does have a very specific 3D shape. And remember that the specific three-dimensional shape of molecules is very important to determining their function. So the bonds between the three phosphate groups are very special. Pause this video for a second and look at a diagram of ATP. What do you notice about the three phosphates as they're really closely scrunched up next to each other? If you're thinking, okay, I have no idea what you're talking about, think about what you know about charges that are the same but happen to be in close proximity to one another like negative and negative charge, if they're close to each other in a magnet, what would happen? Now look at the picture of ATP. Focus on those three phosphates. What do you see about the charges there? Okay, so I hope you really actually paused and looked at it. The phosphate groups, those chemical groups that you learned are called phosphate, they not only are really polar because they have those oxygen phosphate bonds, but they also have negative charges. And when they're packed really close together, those negative charges repel one from the other. So the covalent bond between the three phosphates is really weak. It's like the repulsion is so strong but the attraction is just a little stronger than the repulsion. So the three phosphates are connected, but they're just barely holding on to one another. So it takes very low activation energy, very, very small amount of uh, destabilization 
to break those phosphate bonds. And when you break the bo covalent bond between the third and the second phosphate, the remember the bigger molecule now becomes broken into two pieces. Now you have a phosphate, a phosphate just by itself, and ADP by itself. Now we have smaller, less organized two pieces than what you had before. So the breakage of A TP into ADP is an exergonic reaction and therefore energy is released at the end of that reaction. ATP is broken in a process called hydrolysis, hydrolysis, breakage with water. We talked about this before. From being in one piece, all ATP is just connected all together to now phosphate being separated from the remaining ADP, okay? And energy is released during this process. So ATP hydrolysis, right? This means ATP being broken down into ADP and phosphate releases a lot of energy because the bond that we just broke was really uh, weak. There was a lot of repulsive forces between the three negatively charged phosphate groups and therefore it was really quick to break it down and release that energy. So we think of the triphosphate tail of ATP, those three phosphates, that part of the molecule, is like a, a compressed spring, and then it can repulse and spring, uh, releasing that phosphate. So most of the work that is done in the cell that requires input of energy Remember, work is something that's not going to happen on its own. It only happens when energy is invested. Most of cellular work is powered by ATP hydrolysis, meaning by investing, putting ATP right there, 
having it break down, release energy, and then you're going to use that energy to power something else in your cell that needs energy. At that point, ATP will be broken, and that's kind of like an energy a low battery, right? Maybe your phone, you were using your phone all day, and by the end of the day, the battery on the phone is dead. What do you do with that? How do you continue to use your phone? You have to plug the phone in and recharge it, recharge the battery by getting energy from somewhere else, right? So you plug it into a socket in the wall, an outlet, and elect electrical energy f coming from somewhere, bur burning coal, I hope not, but burning coal or wind energy or uh, power dams in the river, supplied electricity came into your wall and you are using that external energy source to power your battery in your phone so you can use that battery again the next day. So in our body, when ATP is used up because it got broken apart and the energy from that got used for something, now you just have the two broken parts, phosphate and ADP floating around. What do we do with that in the cell? We will put it back together but in order to do that, that's like charging a battery in your phone. We have to get some external energy from somewhere. So ATP is a renewable resource that is generated when you add that phosphate back. So here's the thing. If breaking ATP into two pieces was an exergonic reaction, then putting it back together, basically doing the opposite thing, ADP plus phosphate, that is then an endergonic reaction. And an endergonic reaction is not going to happen unless you put in energy. Where are we getting that energy? We get energy from the food that we eat to build ATP. And then ATP, when it's all charged up and it's in an ATP form, then we can use it as a battery for every place in the cell that requires energy. We call this the ATP cycle. Okay, so this is where we put it all together. ATP, adenosine triphosphate, where you have the three phosphates together, it's a charged up, we call it high energy molecule. When water hits it in a particular way, hydrolysis reaction happens. That means one of the phosphates will break apart. That will cause the two broken pieces, ADP and phosphate, to be at a lower energy state than the ATP was before. Because remember, bigger, more organized things hold more energy but are less stable. Smaller, less organized things hold less energy but are more stable. The difference in the internal energy between ATP and ADP plus phosphate is released. It's like a little tiny mini explosion happening and that energy can be used like a battery energy to do endergonic reactions in your cell, like pumping ions against their gradient, right? That's active transport. It requires energy. ATP serves as that energy. But now you have ADP plus phosphate that are like, oh, they're broken apart and they're low energy. This is like a battery that has run out of juice doesn't have as much energy as we want it to have. How do we recharge it so it can be useful again? Well, we have to get energy 
from outside, and this comes from the food that we eat, and the energy from the food that we eat is used to put together ADP and phosphate and recharge that battery. We will learn how we get energy from the food we eat to recharge ATP in the next chapter. For now, you just have to trust that that happens. So again, ATP getting hydrolyzed or broken, that process is an exergonic reaction. And the energy from that reaction is used to fuel different endergonic reactions, like active transport across a phospholipid bilayer. Putting ADP and phosphate back together, recharging that molecule, that's not spontaneous. That's not going to happen on its own. That is an endergonic reaction and requires investment of energy, which we get from food. As organisms live and grow, they're constantly in the process of making and breaking bonds in molecules. Metabolism is the sum of all the chemical reactions that take place in an organism. Metabolism includes catabolism and anabolism. Catabolism includes the processes that break down complex molecules into simpler molecules while harvesting their energy and storing it, usually in the form of ATP. Anabolism, Anabolism includes, includes the processes, processes that build more complex molecules from simpler molecules. From simpler molecules. The, energy the energy acquired, acquired through catabolic, catabolic processes is used, is used to drive anabolic, anabolic processes. processes. Neither, Neither catabolism, catabolism nor anabolism, anabolism is completely efficient, efficient. So, at so at each step, some of the some available, of the available energy, energy is lost, lost into the environment, into the environment as, heat. as heat. So this is saying that in general in your body, when you eat stuff like big molecules of protein or carbohydrates or fats, you break them down in your stomach and intestines, and the process of breaking them down is called catabolism. You're catabolizing these molecules. Those are endergonic reactions when you break these bigger things into tinier molecules and energy from that is released into our body and we use that energy to build ATP. And then we take ATP energy, break up the ATP to release that energy and use it to build our own proteins and our own big complex structures, which is an anabolic process and it's called anabolism. So these are just examples. Remember that to move things against a gradient is called active transport and it requires energy. Well, that energy comes from ATP being right there and breaking apart and that supplying the energy for things to get pumped against their gradient. We also saw in the video that I showed in class as well as from other examples that to move vesicles like when we build things in rough ER and then you have to move it in a big sphere, in a big vesicle to the Golgi and then from Golgi to the plasma membrane, that movement happens along microtubules walking on those cellular highways on those microtubules. Each step of that movement requires ATP to be broken. So for one little footstep of that protein that is carrying the big vesicle, ATP is required.